Welcome to this um, webinar on the role of pre-development or uh, redevelopment audits um, as part of a transition to a more circular built environment. Um, I'm Katie Lindsay, I work for the Greater London Authority in the uh, Waste and Circular Economy team. Um, and this event is part of Circular Economy Week, um, led by Re London, um, and it's supported um, on the basis of the circuit project um, by uh, the European Union's Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Program. Um, circuit, for those uh, who don't know the acronym, is um, Circular Construction in Regenerative Cities. Um, so I'd like to start off by thanking our presenters and panellists from our group of um, circuit project partners. Um, so um, speaking today, we have um, contributions from um, BRE, from Grimshaw Architects, um, from AECOM and one of our demonstration uh, collaboration partners, um, Erith. So, or Erith, sorry uh, for the pronunciation there. Um, so I think... Um, We'll go straight into the first presentation and I'll give you a little bit of an overview of circuit. So David, if you can share that and then I'll, I'll hand over to you um, to introduce um, the, the policy perspective. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, just a little bit about Circuit. Um, it's a four year collaborative project which started in uh, mid 2019 um, with 31 uh, partners across London, Copenhagen, Hamburg and Helsinki. So there's a number of work packages as part of this and um, demonstrators and they all focus on the area areas of demolition and reuse refurbishment and transformation and principles for designing new circular buildings and future developments. Um, the project always also explores citywide systems, so that's governance and planning, um, material and data flows and training and knowledge sharing. So um, I'm going to hand over to uh, David Cheshire now from AECOM, who work with us at the GLA on um, our um, circular economy policies, um, and he's going to give you a bit of an introduction to that and the work that AECOM is supporting us with. So over to you, David. Brilliant. Thanks, Katie. Um, yeah, so I'll just very give you a very quick overview. I'm sure a lot of you know this anyway, but a quick overview of the um, the, the policy context and, and, and where we're at um, uh, in, in delivering um, circular economy statements. As many of you know, the London Plan's now been adopted, um, and uh, the uh, there are various documents around circular economy, particularly the Primer, which I think is an, is an excellent document that set out what what we need to to do. Um, and the general idea is that, well, there's two key policies, uh, policy D3, which is all around the design and uh, approach for a circular economy. And then the uh, policy SI7 is about uh, the waste and supporting the circular economy and the requirement, most importantly, the requirement for submitting circular economy statements for um, anything that's referable to, to the GLA, which is a massive uh, leap forward. And I, I think it's really, I'm really excited that, that, that this is all happening now. And we've had a, about, about a year's worth of uh, CE statements coming through that we've been reviewing and um, and, and pushing um, project teams to, to meet and with comply with this guidance which is uh, here so there's a this is the October version which is pretty close to to final um, we're going to be pushing out or the GLA going to be pushing out a a final version post consultation um, in, in a few months um, that will just pick up uh, the, the brilliant comments we've had from a, a lot of people. Interestingly, one of the key themes that comes out is actually around pre-demolition audits and the, the need to make them uh, it, make it clearer that they need to be very much part of, of what's happening in the process um, it, it for, for, for redevelopment. Um, I, I'm sure you, you know this, but basically the core principles are obviously to, to uh, be sort of lean design principles and um, using less resources really to get rid of the concept of waste completely if we can ultimately and, and keep uh, resources uh, in perpetuity so for, forever uh, reclaiming, reusing um, rather than downcycling and, and losing the value of our resources. Um, and there's there's four key commitments. I won't go through all of them. Sorry, it's four four key requirements for a for a detailed um, circular economy statement. I'll just, I'll just pull out the key elements of that. And I think the first one, which is the strategic approach, is is very important to to what we're talking about today, because it's saying you know have you got an existing building on the site? If you have, ideally want to keep it. 
that would be ideal, but there's lots of situations where that, that doesn't make sense. Um, if we're not doing that, then what we definitely need to be doing is reclaiming and looking out and reclaiming the, re the residual value out of the building elements and the materials. And that's where we need to do those pre-refurbishment and pre-demolition audits. As And I think that's an absolute uh, key pin and key part of, of circular economy and, and, and claiming that, 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 that anything we can out of the building. Because if we leave it to... <clears throat> To the traditional approach, it's always about um, crushing everything and shredding everything, and that's not not what we're trying to do with the circular economy. <clears throat> um, and, and related to that, there's actually that there are some key commitments. These these are the um, targets that are, that are tied back to the policy, uh, and as part of that, the construction and demolition waste um, is is now being reported in terms of the, the amount of waste arising from any demolition works as well as the construction and excavation. So um, there aren't th those are the targets are only in percentage diversion from landfill at the moment. But as we're recording that data, we're going to be able to start having an evidence base to be able to set targets in the future and start to, to, to push that down. So it's not just about how much are you diverting from landfill, but ultimately how much quantity of waste in tons are we generating and how can we stop that so much of it being coming out because actually all that stuff has got to go somewhere and currently it's all being shipped down the the river down to to Essex or wherever and, uh, and they've got to find a home for it and actually one of the key drivers to having a circular economy policy in London is actually all the regions outside London saying can you stop sending us all your waste because we haven't got anywhere to put it um uh and related to that, of course, is is um, the the uh, the design strategy and the whole design principles about retain, refit, refurbish, uh, reclaim, and reuse and remanufacture. And so, and those sort of the the, the fourth and fifth layer there are really relevant to today, uh, along with you know in the future, hoping that we can design buildings that are with us longer uh, for designing for adaptability, but assuming that they all get at least partially taken down at some point is that um, they're designed for disassembly to enable um, better use of our resources in the future. Um, David, sorry. David, before you go on, there's a question in the chat that it seems um, appropriate to address now, and it's about mm. the um, where circular economy statements are required. Um, so um, that would the question is specifically about um, are they required for major, major refurbishment development so um i don't know if you want to answer that or um i can i can also chip in might give yeah, some context to the bit absolutely that so any, anything that's referable to the mayor uh, as a planning um uh a, a a, a, a project that requires planning and has has to go through the JLA. Yes, they have to do a circular economy statement. Yeah, and actually, you'll do if you're doing a refurbishment over a new build, you, you'll be you're onto a winner from the start. Uh, and the same with the whole life carbon assessment, which is quite closely related to this and is picking up, you know, the idea of what um, how much um, embodied carbon is associated with the redevelopment works. Um, you'll if you're refurbing rather than new build, you're going to be at least half if not more of depending how much you keep of the embodied carbon impact straight away just because you half of the embodied carbon is associated with the substructure and the structure of the building so yeah does that hopefully that answers that it does yeah thank you Cool. Um, and the last thing really was just to say that, you know, as, as I said earlier, that, that this this tons per meter squared will become uh, well, it is already a metric, but will will gradually come in as a target. Uh, and that's sort of reporting here on, on, on how much demolition waste is arising. And what I'm hoping is that what happens is is actually as these targets kick in and, and, and this policy starts to bite more strongly and we actually have more um, uh, hard targets in there is actually that there'll be a there'll be a, a pushback effect up through the the decision chain because obviously it's too late at Reba stage two to start saying oh we should refurbish instead of new build probably uh, when we're going for planning but actually if if developers know that they're going to be questioned about this and they'll have to meet stringent targets for uh, embodied carbon for um, weight of the building for waste arising from demolition they're hopefully going to select sites where they've got buildings that they think they can um, refurbish and and repurpose um, uh, and, and that will really help I think um, so yeah so these are the stages which I'm not sure I need to get much detail on but obviously at the outline application stage it's only really looking at that strategic approach that first table but at that point that's really when we want to be getting those into those decisions around 
shall we keep this or shall we shall we demolish it? Um, at the full application stage, you then need to do your full um, detailed um, circular economy statement. And that's when, at that point, you definitely will have to have um, pre-refurbishment, pre-demolition audits uh, completed. Uh, and there isn't really many reasons why you, you shouldn't you can't do one that you know you should should you really do need to do these and i think it should be i think it is going to get stronger and stronger in there that you need to do that uh, oh yeah and worth just mentioning that uh, at post completion this is new and this is a new area for gla as well is, is that actually you will have to do your um a post completion report to show how well you've done against the commitments you made at the planning stage and that that is going to be really interesting to see how that pans out um, because we'll have to do the same. We're doing the same for whole life carbon as well. And actually for the BC work, which is the um, um, energy strategy to demonstrate that you're actually meeting meeting the uh, operational energy performance that you, you set out to do. So I think it's it's now about actually making sure all this stuff happens in, in reality as well, which is going to be really interesting to see um, and lots of good feedback. So that's it for me. Thank you. I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, I'm going to ask um, our next uh, presenters to start sharing their slides. Um, and just to say, obviously, with, with what David's just run through, that's pretty much a whistle-stop tour. And you know, having started with a few tech problems, we're a few minutes behind. Um, we could do a whole session and have done a whole session um, on um, the requirement for circular economy statements. So bear in mind that we've got um, some time coming up for discussion. So um, keep in mind any particular questions that you've got there. But certainly uh, the GLA um, ourselves in the waste team and the planning team and also David's team at AECOM are happy to support anyone that um, is looking at doing um, circular economy statements um, for any questions that we, we can't answer here. Um, so without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to Catherine Adams from BRE and James Pay from um, Erith um, to talk you through a bit more um, detail on pre-demolition pre audits. Thank you, Katie. Can you see my screen okay and hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. very Great. good, thank you. Great, um, so I'm gonna run through a few slides and then invite James to speak. Um, so James is from ERIF and that's um, a demolition contractor. So really useful to hear, hear their, their perspectives on pre-demolition audits. Um, and I'm uh, from BRE. So um, just to give you a bit of background, um, so we've really been sort of doing pre-demolition audits for quite a long time now. Um, so it's good to see them getting more and more attention. So BRE has been involved in resource efficiency for 25 years plus, me about 20 years of that. And um, I'll talk a little bit about BREAM and how BREAM pre-demolition pre audits are record, uh, used in that. And also our smart way system, which also allows you to do pre-demolitions on that as well. Um, I just thought it would be useful to share some stats about um, what is actually happening with our construction and demolition waste. Um, so these are from 2016. The government doesn't regularly update these, unfortunately. Um, but as you can see from there, we have about 120 million tonnes of construction, demolition, excavation waste produced in England. And around half of that is either excavation waste or spoil. Um, so that leaves about 60 million tonnes of construction and demolition waste. The national data doesn't really break it down from construction or demolition, but based on sort of previous experience, we would probably say about 45 million tonnes of that is, is, is from demolition. And as you can see following the chart down, a lot of it is recovered, around 90% uh, is recovered, but as David alluded to, a lot of that is downcycled, so it's crushed as fill, pile mats, that sort of thing, or uh, timber shredded for um, biomass and, and those sorts of routes. Um, we still, though, do have a fair bit going to landfill when you compare it to other sectors as well, and so one of the actions I'm working on in the Green Construction Board is to understand a little bit be better about what that is and, and where it's coming from. Next slide. Oh, yeah, sorry about that. Um, we also don't have very good reuse figures um, 
the last sort of national survey was done in 2011 so it's quite difficult to know if we are starting to to reuse more rather than just recycle um uh, and whether some of sort of the circular economy policies and thinking is, is starting to have an effect but but based on this in previous years um you can see that it's not it's not a good news story and that the amount of materials that have been reclaimed has 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 decreased quite substantially and this is for architectural um salvage um and there could be reasons for that there could be that more has been going into the recycling stream or we're just not demolishing buildings that have that have that architectural value where that where the materials can can be reclaimed um so a potted history of pre demissional audits in the UK. As I said, we undertook a first one in nine. I think it was the first one anyway. We're we're um, taking that <laughs> in 1996. So quite a long time and that time ago on the um, building that was um, demolished to make way for environmental building. And then the ICE did a very good document back in 2003, updated in 2008 with support of RAP. Which, is, which was a demolition protocol linking into sort of um, net waste. That had, that's quite hard to find now. Um, so possibly uh, could be updated. And then we had site waste management plan regulations, which did cover demolition to a point. Um, they were obviously um, taken away though, I think in 2011 or 2013. Um, and then really from that point onwards, the main driver has been BREAM and now more recently um, GLA. Um, and as you can see, there is more, uh, as Bre through the time of BREAM, there's been more sort of robust requirements, if you like. Um, the industry has also produced guidance itself, like the NFDC and um, we worked with um, CIWM, the, the Construction and Waste Group, to also produce guidance. So, um, as as the years go on, it's getting it, the, it's getting busier, which is good news. So we've carried about out about fifty that's fifty audits at least over that over that time period. Um, and within that, we now have a code of practice. It's now recognised as a BREAM um, credit by itself. Um, one of the more important things, and I'm not sure it's happening that well, is once you do a pre demolition audit, what actually happens <laughs> with any of the recommendations that you make. So it would be nice to have a sort of a post performance review and then um, a closer link to what can be reside, um, re you know, what can be used in the new building. So I think originally pre demolition audits were very much about tracking waste, but now it's more about how you can reuse elements whether it's in a new build whether it's in a new building or uh, buildings um, in the vicinity um, and then there's an obvious link to sort of design for disassembly um, so what can we learn in the way that we construct and then demolish our buildings now to make them disassembly uh, disassemble and adaptable for the future as well and I'll pick up on BIM in a minute um, so this is um, a process from the code of practice um, that I that I talked about. You can download it here. It's a couple it's a couple of years old now, but it gives you um, details about when to carry out the pre pre redevelopment audit. These are called redevelopment audits, but it's, it's the same thing: pre redevelopment, pre demolition, pre refurbishment. Um, and obviously, earlier in the process, you can do that the better. James, do you want to say anything about that? Uh, yeah, so I mean, from my point of view, um, we sort of end up doing two types of pre-demolition audit, I suppose. Um, so we have the one where it's a bit of a tick box, I guess, for Brian, where you get it to do it sort of post-tender just before you start on site, um, which to be honest, you're looking at circular options and the, and the demolition contract is almost on site, it's probably too late. Um, but increasingly we are, being involved earlier and earlier so during the tender stage actually before planning sometimes we're advising on these now and that's where we can really um, use those pre demolition audits to be sort of actively feed into what can be reused recycled um, and re retained as well um, yeah so from I mean from our point of view the earlier the better um, it needs to sort of be embedded embedded throughout um, 
I think the demolition contractor, any, any demolition contractor will say they can do it, but it does need to sort of be set out as, as early as possible, really. Thanks, James. Um, so the next the next bit of guidance talks about who should do the who who should do the audits, um, and that differs really. So I think um, GLA and Bream refurbishment requires an independent person to do it, but I think for new construction you can have the demolition contractor to do it. And I think there's pros and cons from um, whether you do use an independent person or whether you do use um, someone for the project team, and maybe that would be a good good discussion point um, later. Um, we also talk about the procedure as well, so um, how you should actually go and do one, i.e. try and get as much information as you can about the building, which can be very difficult. Um, so sometimes plans just aren't available or they're just not up to date, particularly on the internal layout, and then preferably go and do a site visit. But I do know some people do do, do virtual pre-demolition audits, which I would question. <laughs> I would question the sort of accuracy of um, of the information you're getting there, and how and how valuable they are. And then a comparison of actual performance against targets, which is something um, that I personally don't see. So it, that would be quite a useful exercise to just see if if what is recommended actually happens, and if it doesn't happen, why doesn't it happen? So lessons learned there. And then also sort of how to how to report and communicate on that. James, I don't know if you want to say anything any, anything more about about what I just talked about. Um, it's something we obviously do at the end of projects, where the end of the demolition phase to close it close out those pre-demolition audits for Brian generally. Um, it's whether there's no sort of then feedback mechanism on sort of any sort of lessons that in general they kind of seem to go into a bit of a black hole as it were it sort of ticks that box um we don't sort of get that sort of collated information um it's a useful exercise i mean in general it, it really highlights how um the key the key element of it is actually deciding on the routes for that material um afterwards the volumes tend to be very different because you, you they're not intrusive surveys generally pre damage audits again as you mentioned depends on the quality of the information you have um so the key thing is actually yes making sure that all those material streams are then sent to the appropriate place but generally the lessons learned will be around how early were these things factored in did you from the start decide on where floor tiles were going that kind of thing otherwise they do tend to get bundled up as part of the soft strip yeah Thanks, James, for that. Can, and sorry, Catherine, can I chip in there as well? A second, sorry, mm -hmm. um, just because we are seeing now starting to see these these happen post, um, you know, post planning, and and it's been really interesting to try and see how we we build stuff into the contract. I don't think it is enough to say implement the you know one line liner in there to say implement the pre demolition audit because it's all recommendations and it's all relatively vague. And I think uh, we've been trying to put some some. Um, clauses together that really tie that down to say you know the demolition contractor needs to do this 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 and this I'm not saying they have to do everything but they have to look at it properly and demonstrate what they have they've considered everything and i think that's this, this is what we've, we've got to do and then and then the, the demolition contractors get a fair go to be able to respond to that and say this is what we can can't do um, and make sure it's included in the costs and the program <laughs> yeah yeah, that's, yeah sorry james you go I, I was gonna say that that's absolutely key yeah it needs to be that understanding we're actually through our tender process now, we are beginning to offer you sort of a compliant tender, but also offer one that isn't cheap and quicker, but actually perhaps is more circular or lower carbon. Um, but obviously that at least highlights to the client what the difference in program or costs might be. Yeah, and I think that's important as well because because what and when when I do pre-demission audits, we will recommend reuse um, as well as as well as well as recycling, but but we don't factor in how much time extra that could take in terms of doing some of those reuse options. And obviously, um, you know, there, there, is a, there is a sort of resource implication for doing that, which the demolition contractor would know much better than, than for us. Um, right, I'm just, I'm gonna whiz through these a little bit. Um, so what we recommend in the, um, in the code of practice is to is to set targets and as you can see best practice really is starting to set targets for the product and materials for a reuse and also also recycling obviously that does depend on the type of building and if it's a pre-demolition audit or a pre-refurbishment audit you'll tend to get more reuse possibly on a pre-refurbishment audit just because 
aspects of some of the materials like the ceiling tiles and carpet tiles are coming out um, and it, it, it is it can be more difficult to sort of reuse a lot of these sort of old older structures if you like in terms of sort of the concrete slabs um, and the and the and the steel beams and it's quite hard for a pre-demission audit to sort of determine that as James said they're not intrusive so you don't really have a great understanding of the types of beams that are in there for instance unless you can see them or the depth or the depths of sort of the concrete slabs and that sort of thing. Um, so this just gives you an example. You will also see when you tend to do a pre-demission audit that, that obviously the heavier materials kind of swamp everything else. And it, this is a little bit tricky for reuse because even if you're sort of saying, oh, we can reuse all of the, I don't know, all, all of the timber or the slate tiles or whatever, the, the percentage only sort of gets to sort of three or 4% unless you are dealing with sort of bricks that have been laid with um, lime mortar. Um, so, so it would be good to try and um, maybe measure things a little bit differently sometimes, and not not necessarily focus too much on the on the quantities, which are quite um, sort of assumptions and estimates anyway. Um, and this is just an example of a refurbishment audit. This one is a little bit different because it actually gives you some sort of valuation for some of the. Um, possible items that can be reclaimed and they're, they're, they're much more sort of from an architectural salvage point of view. Um, so there's a pre-demolition audit credit available in Bream, so this is for Bream new construction um, and it should be carried out at the concept design stage by a competent person and again, it's looking at setting targets for reuse, um, recycling and waste management. Um, and it should also be referenced in the resource management plan. And then there's this comparison with actuals versus estimates. Um, so I think this has probably been sort of one of the main drivers for pre-demission audits, but whether, whether they've actually made a massive difference to what happens when a building is demolished is, is questionable. And as James, James alluded to, sometimes they can be done at sort of the very, very last minute, which means sort of the findings aren't really going to influence anything from the design, or it's going to be quite hard to influence what the, what the demolition contractor to do, can do. Because finding sort of different homes for materials and, and reuse does, does take more time than sort of generally what you know generally what the demolition contractor would do james do you want to come in there at all uh, sorry what was the question <laughs> <laughs> I, all right i was just saying that it would it, you know it does take a bit more time to find sort of different routes for materials whether you know whether you want to be upcycled or really yeah. locally that sort of thing yeah and sometimes it's an issue of especially working in london if you're doing you know a lot of sort of a tower block or something like that the sheer volume of that material for reuse sometimes can't be actually taken by these reuse people um and slightly bizarrely well not bizarrely the, the, the system in england or in the uk is that actually still costs almost more for demolition contractor to remove these things for reuse which is eventually a product for someone else anyway so it's slightly slightly uh, backwards in that sense as well yeah, and I know I know the demolition industry. They've they've inve invested heavily in their in in their big machines, <laughs> which which are great from an efficiency point of view in terms of bringing a building down quickly. But yeah. then it and but that you know it does bring it down in sort of you know with with little large bits, yeah, <laughs> little but regard I mean, for sort of re reuse of items. I think, I guess. Yeah, I think it's maybe something to say about how procurement happens in the built environment in general. Um, we are demolition is quite a you know if, if it's a 250 million pound project demolition is a very small percentage of that it might be five million pounds for whatever so and we are the thing that kind of stops the new development the new asset being built mm. so um it kind of from the client's point of view they want it done quickly and efficiently so that we're out of the way so the new build which could be 200 million pounds get started on and actually then they sort of realize that asset but um yeah so that sort of the time i think is probably the, the key thing that needs to be looked at and how and how that's given to the demolition track contractor to improve removing materials in a reusable manner yeah i'd agree with that 
Um, and then there's also credits within Bream in terms of um, reaching um, target targets for demolition. I mean, when we do pre-demolition audits, I would put the targets are usually around 90, 95% in terms of diversion from landfill. Um, most of that would be recycling. Um, and then you're probably looking at sort of reuse targets depending on the building from anything from about sort of 2% could go up to sort of 30% if you're starting to include some of the bricks and, and steel beams as well. Um, there's other examples of pre-demolition audits, so other BREAM schemes also cover them. Um, the SCAR assessment um, requires pre-refurbishment audits. They're a little bit different in that, in, in that instead of having, looking at all the different types of materials that are coming off, they focus on um, on the main ones, so for offices, it would be carpet, ceiling tiles, doors. I've had lots of chats about doors recently. Someone saying that it's impossible to reuse them because of fire tests, because um, you actually have to burn the door to make sure it's fire resistant. I don't know if that's true or not, but that seems a bit of an issue for doors. Um, and then um, David's talked about the examples from um, the, for the requirements for the London plan. So I just wanted to talk about a few lessons learned, really. Um, as, as James and I have both said, it, it, there is a lot of guesswork when you're doing a pre-demolition audit, especially if you haven't got very good plans, because um, it's just, it's, you know, they're not intrusive. You are making um, assumptions about what the insulation is or the thickness of some of the walls and the slabs and the column depths. Um, so, um, I, where it is important to get sort of a ballpark for the amounts to be expected, especially for reuse. So you can obviously count, um, you know, the area for ceiling tiles, um, carpet tiles, count for um, windows if they've got some sort of architectural value, that sort of thing. Um, it's, it's quite, I would question, you know, whether it's worth getting, you know, complete accuracy on, on the other figures. Um, they can be a bit of a greenwashing exercise, so they can unfortunately be a bit of a bit of a tick box exercise. Where Catherine, um, that's that's a useful um, point for me to come in with one of the questions from our attendees, um, which we because uh, we're short on time, we might have to kind of pick up um, in full discussion when we come to the discussion point. But um, the question is, how do we ensure that we get real, real value from pre-demolition audits and that they're not just a tick box exercise? And could any clauses or requirements be included in contractor tender processes? So that might be too much to answer now, but it kind of fits in with, with, uh, with your slide at the moment. So if there's anything that you can say kind of briefly on that, um, if not, we can pick it up as part of the wider discussion. Yeah, I think it's what, what Dave said, really, trying to put a few clauses into demolition contracts, which, which which could be target targets to me on reuse or just just um, at least requiring them to explore different options as what they would have would have done and um, and then also sort of reporting back really I think that's one of the issues is just 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 having sort of a post review exercise which doesn't often happy happen um, we've talked about needing to be done in plenty of time before refurbishment or demolition the you know the the earlier you can do it the better as you know that that's just simple really um and then what can be done differently from for reuse and recycling so again that depends on having the time to find sort of different routes for market for some of the materials and products and it very, may very well be it would be quite hard to use the products and materials that are occurring from the demolition of an old building into a new building if they're sort of you know completely different if a if a if a large sort of glass facade steel office building is going up in the place of a brick building um so therefore you need to find sort of other opportunities um there's much more talk on reuse of structural elements i would question how how far you can go with that on a pre-demolition audit you can you can suggest sort of what elements are in there and give approximate quantities but pre-demolition audits as they're not intrusive won't be looking at um you know the condition and that sort of thing so that would need a lot further work if you like um 
And then pre-demolition audits could probably touch a bit more on the environmental savings and costs. I don't think they do that much, that much at the moment. So um, again, linking into sort of the whole sort of whole life carbon agenda. So what would be the carbon savings from doing reuse versus recycling, that sort of thing. And I've talked a bit about having to track um, progress. I think that's needed. Um, I've nearly finished. <laughs> So um, what's the future? Um, Pre-demission audits, they can be quite, um, well, they're quite sort of, sort of labour intensive. So anything that can automate them would be useful. And there's much, you know, in the future, I do think BIM models will help that process and material passports. That's probably going to be sometime in the future, though, because obviously a lot of buildings that are getting ref refurbed or demolished now just, just don't have those data sets that go with them. Um, and ideally, what we what you would like is just, just to have that data set available at any point, not necessarily when you're doing a refurbishment or, or, or demolition, which can sort of guide, guide you in the sort of the asset, in the management of that asset in, ter in terms of you know, its value and the value of materials and should it be refurbished and demolished. Um, the government is doing work on electronic waste tracking. I'm not quite sure how that will feed into pre demolition audits at all. And we'll hear a bit more about what um, circuit circuits doing in this area. Um, there's a few bits of useful guidance. So there's the code of practice, which I talked about. Um, the NFDC have this protocol, um, which is also quite useful. Um, European Commission has a guidance on waste audits for demolition. They, they're a bit more waste focused, I would suggest. So how you're managing your waste, making sure you're classifying it correctly and it's got traceability. And then a few projects from um, abroad looking at um, sort of best practice for pre-demolition audits. The FCBRE one, I can't I think that's how <laughs> it hasn't got a short acronym, has it? Um, that's quite useful to look at because that has looked at sort of more reuse as well. So um, worth having a look at that. That's it. I don't know if James wants to say anything quickly. No, no, that's all good, I think. Okay. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So uh, happy to share any questions. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks, James. Um, I think we'll just hand straight over now um, to Peter Swallow from uh, Graham Shaw for one of the examples from the circuit project, and um, then we can pick anything else up in the discussion shortly. Hi there. Uh, so yeah, my name is Peter Swallow. I'm an associate and I'm the head of sustainability at Grimshaw Architects. Um, I've been working on the circuit project now for a couple of years, and there's uh, been quite a lot of work that's been done in the realm of pre-demolition audits through through the project um, in collaboration with BRE. Um, so I just wanted to take you through uh, sort of an overview of the work that we've done um, and how we've tried to apply that and, and actually try and answer some of the questions that um, that Catherine had raised there about how do we take pre-demission audits to the sort of the next level and how do we how do we track outcomes from them and how do we actually make some meaningful output from them. So just as an overview, uh, the first one of the first deliverables that's come out of the circuit project was looking at a state of the art report into the state of play in terms of collating data around uh, demolition. Um, this report um, then gave recommendations around um, the types of uh, templates that should be put in place for uh, creating a standardized approach to pre-demolition audits. Uh, and that's something that we've then taken as a sort of framework and through a number of demonstrators uh, within, the, uh, within the circuit team across the four cities that are involved, we've started to implement that, uh, that framework. In the UK, we've had a couple of projects um, that have, um, that have done a pre-demolition audit. The BRE have, have produced reports for those. They've used that template. They've also then produced a sort of client-facing document uh, based on that template, which goes into a little bit more detail about the context. It provides a bit more background and, and some, some additional recommendations as to what could be done in order to reuse and minimize waste. Um, we really use that as a sort of launch point. So, some of the projects, and I'm going to talk in generalized terms from the sort of lessons we've learned from this process to date. Uh, one of the things that we've um, that we've realized is that that report in and of itself is great. Um, and the content of that is, is um, as Catherine 
was saying, has been uh, developed over the last 20 years through the BRE. But if we want to sort of push that forward and actually start to get results, we need to start to engage with the data that these, these reports produce. So you can see here some extracted data from, from one of these example reports, um, which is you know, familiar information. Um, but we really wanted to take that and, and push that forward. Um, so we're looking at things here like the, the total quantity of materials, um, we also looked at using um, BIM and looking at LIDAR scanning and, and photogrammetry uh, with uh, our partners at UCL to start to, sorry, at Imperial, to start to see if we could enhance the data that we were collecting. Uh, as Catherine said, some of these, most of the time these audits are done as a, as a visual inspection. We wanted to see if we could get a different grain of detail that would actually add to the, um, uh, to the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, to the quality of the data that we were getting, we might actually then be able to create a BIM model um, that would help then support future um, strategies in terms of how we might implement uh, reuse potential for these uh, materials and these systems. As you can see here, we, we identified for this particular building things that could be reused, uh, things that could be recycled, um, and then we wanted to really take that forward. And it's really um, going back to what David said about the, the guidance um, that the GLA has produced, the, the requirement to uh, look at the technical feasibility um, of recovering residual value. Um, but how do you actually go about doing that? That's, that's really what we were interested in exploring and understanding how we could go beyond um, and actually create a sort of complementary set of documents that would sit with, um, uh, with and alongside the pre-demission audit. So you can see here this, this flow diagram. Um, from having an initial commission for a building, we were looking to add additional information to the initial report that we got through the BRE. Um, so that report was done. Um, that's very much determined on the access you can be granted to, to a building in terms of uh, access, um, both physically uh, and in terms of the uh, archival documentation you've got. We wanted to then implement um, sort of supplementary data around uh, 3D scans, uh, which was uh, had varying degrees of success on the projects that we've done today. We also brought in a, a QS to start looking at cost options because we think that early on is really, really fundamental. Whilst the market for secondary materials isn't mature, we think it's it's really about um, breaking down perceived barriers around the um, reapplication of, of materials. So we wanted to look at the cost benefit analysis of that. And all of that then was sort of put together into a report which was looking at the circular potential. Now, this is very much obviously focused on material reuse or reuse of um entire systems or entire buildings. Um, we then, in addition to that, we looked at an adaptive uh, feasibility study, which went into actually looking at scenarios on how you could reuse these systems or these entire buildings. Um, and then almost without having a mature market, be able to then go out and actually pursue potential clients to actually take on um, and actually buy up these materials and these systems um, and redeploy them on other sites. So we saw, the potential of creating these additional reports that would supplement the pre-demolition audit. We wonder whether as time goes on, these might be additional steps within that pre-demolition audit process, and it might be amalgamated into one workflow. Um, but that's obviously something that will come out in the, um, the findings of the circuit uh, work that we're undertaking. We have at Grimshaw um, some past experience in demounting buildings and, and moving them to other sites. So that's something we certainly brought um, to some of the discussions we had and, and some of the ideas that we had and, and experience we, we fed into some of the scenarios that we looked at. So as I said, the first report we were looking at was really understanding what the potential was, um, looking at um, particular use cases, understanding what the tonnage potential um, of reuse was, looking at also things like the, um, uh, the CO2 savings. So not just looking at it from a cost point of view or looking at it from a waste saved point of view, but, but looking at the actual carbon saving associated that, looking at ways you could then um, market these materials and, and these systems, um, and looking at ways that you could then demonstrate their reuse uh, when you're looking uh, for people that potentially could take this on. Another point, uh, going back to what James was saying about um, demolition costs, um, this was something we challenged um, on, on one of the particular projects that we worked on. We wanted to understand, is it really the case that deconstructing a building is more costly um, than, than just tearing it down. And there are complexities around that. It depends on the, on the use case and the building type. It depends on access. Uh, it depends on program as well. And one of the things we wanted to do was um, we engaged early uh, on one particular project uh, with a demolition contractor to understand what the steps would be to actually take a building apart piece by piece and what the additional cost and time implications would be. Um, some of the barriers that we would come, we've come up against, and, and these will be familiar to people, is that uh, a lot of developers, if you're coming in particularly late in a program, um, the idea of um, engaging with the idea of, of selling on building components or entire building systems um, 
is interesting, but only to the point where if it impacts on program or cost, then, then it, it's not interesting to them. Um, we've had some partners who have been very um, happy for us to explore these ideas. Um, and we've, we've had some success in that this early engagement with demolition contractors has actually allowed us to, um, uh, to actually embed some of this thinking into their tender process for demolition. So we're actually on one particular project, we have a scenario where they're going to look at the costs of simply demolishing a building versus actually uh, taking it apart, uh, transporting it to a, to a storage depot uh, and keeping it stored on site in order to prolong the, the opportunity for us to explore uh, selling it onto a third party. Um, the second one of those reports was really then looking into what are the options we'd identified on one particular project that um, the steel st structural frame primary structural frame um, was really um, had an opportunity to be um, sold on and used um, for a new building in its entirety. Um, so we looked at options around uh, re erecting the entire frame, we looked at breaking it down into sub components and we looked at breaking it down into single elements and we looked at what the financial uh, and program implications and what the residual value profile for those three were. Um, in terms of the, uh, the reuse of the frame, um, we understood with the cost manager what the costs of that were compared to using reusing a frame. Um, so it was interesting, so I've, I've actually relabeled this uh, incorrectly, but um, looking at reuse versus um, completely new build, there was a significant saving um, in doing so of about half a million, uh, which was something that we could certainly use to market to a potential buyer. Um, also looking at the carbon profile by reusing um, the structure versus a brand new build, we were saving a significant amount of carbon. Um, so that this all adds to the story of, of um, why there's um, uh, value beyond just the cost value to potential clients to buy a building. We also then looked at um, the potential of how these um, buildings could be reused, how they could be reconfigured, what other um, use cases there were. This all adds to the validity of uh, the proposition of then selling it on to a third party. So you can see here some different scenarios we looked at for a particular building in terms of how it could be reused for um, warehousing, agricultural use, uh, sports stadium, etc. We then obviously looked at the individual component um, scale, um, looked at what, how they could be reused and redeployed on other sites in, in either uh, similar fashion to their current use uh, or as uh, a completely newly conceived way of using them. Um, and all of that sort of culminated into um, uh, lessons learned in terms of uh, what the next steps are uh, that we would need to take in order to sort of um, uh, impact uh, on a potential project. So one of the things we've looked at is obviously um, the different profiles in terms of uh, being able to find a buyer for an entire building versus uh, not having a buyer and what the impacts of that would be. Um, you can see here from um, if we do find a buyer and we have someone that's willing to get money to to save a building there are a number of steps that need to be taken beyond that we've um, others have already talked today about um structural sampling testing recommissioning um getting warranties etc there's there are other steps that, in that process that need to be jumped uh, over and, and um uh, and they're things to be worked through in terms of how you do that how you mitigate the risk and the perceived risk around that um, and then on the other side of it obviously if we if we aren't able to find a buyer it's then looking at maximizing uh, the reuse and the uh, recyclability of, of the materials uh, that are being removed from the site um, the other things we've been looking at are sometimes um, there's going to be a need based on program um, to extend the period by which you have to to find clients um, whilst we don't have a mature, as I said earlier, while we don't have a mature market for, um, uh, for secondary materials, we really need to start to facilitate um, existing developers um, in terms of maximizing the time available to go and find people. One of those, um, uh, one of the things to do that is actually looking at the transport costs, taking it off site if, it, uh, if we have been able to demolish a building, and then also looking at the cost of storage, how much um, uh, cost and how much space is required, which then again prolongs the, uh, the opportunity and keeps the window open for longer to be able to find the clients. Um, so I'm just going to conclude there. Um, there are some other conclusions that came out of our reports, um, which aren't particularly relevant to what we're doing here. But I think just to finish, I think um, the key sort of lesson learned for us is that in order to make the most out of pre-demolition audits, uh, we really need to supplement them in terms of design teams and in terms of project teams, uh, the thinking around how we actually go about doing that and mitigating risk. And I think these two documents that we've developed uh, for, for one of the particular demonstrators we've done uh, looking at pre demission audits has really helped to sort of uh, flesh out what we think those steps are and, and what we need to do in terms of the content uh, in order to help drive that change within the industry. So I'm going to uh, wrap up there. I'm a little bit over time, but uh, hopefully now we can go into uh, Q&A. Thank you.
Thanks, Peter. Um, so we do have a few minutes left now. Um, not as long as we had hoped at the beginning, but um, we've taken some really good questions as we've gone along, so that's great. Um, so really the floor is open now to our audience. So um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat or um, to uh, switch on your camera and, and talk to us directly. Um, if we don't have any, um, I certainly have some questions that I uh, would, would like to pose to our, our panelists. I've got one here, let's have a look. Um, so we've got a question for um, Peter from Perva. So is it normal practice um, or going to be normal practice at Grimshaw? Um, and will you be or are you uh, nudging or lobbying clients to get on board? Um, and what actions do you need from government to enable? So, so quite a lot there uh, for you to answer. Uh, so sorry, just, just to make sure I've got that right. So are, are we at Grimshaw going to be undertaking pre demolition audits as Part of our standard practice is that is that the question i think so yeah um it is it is something we are looking at as part of our drive for uh, uh, or our, rather our commitment to uh, delivering net zero carbon ready buildings by 2025 part of that process is looking at um reuse potential and, and extension of life of, of existing buildings so part of the the process for that will be doing some form of pre demission audit whether we do that in-house or whether it's part of partnering with the likes of the BRE to sort of build a relationship there where they're done on all of our projects is something yet to be determined. But it's definitely something we have a commitment to and it's, we see it as an, an absolute need as part of that, that wider commitment we have to net zero. Brilliant, thank you. Um, it's certainly been really interesting for me how the presentations have kind of linked to each other. You know, how we ensure value coming out of pre-demolition audits and that it's not just a, a tick box exercise, but actually then, um, to demonstrate value, we've got to overcome some of the barriers that um, we've seen spoken about either in the chat um, or, or through our presentations um, in terms of um, regulation and um, grading, you know, expense, storage, all of that kind of thing. So um, it's been a really, really interesting conversation. Um, I think we've got time for another question, um, if anyone has anything hey, well i was thinking i've just added yeah. in um in response to that question about the implementation and sort of, sort of hopefully complementing what peter's been saying which i think was really useful was that the, i found some uk i've just put it in the chat thing there's a uk gbc mm -hmm. report which i found very useful it's got a funny name actually because it talks about um um leasing or something first but it also talks about reuse and there's a there's a few good really good bullet points in there about what you'd need you know that, that I use to help me inspire me to think about about the sorts of uh, clauses you'd put together for, in, for implementation implementing the stuff. Brilliant. You just kind of have to go for it. Get one of them on board and just kind of go for it. And... <laughs> can I just can I just say it's just thinking about it a little bit as well. I've I've done quite a lot of pre demission audits and and the the buildings you do look at vary considerably with ones that do have a lot of reuse potential. So obviously Peter looked at one with you know with a good sort of portal steel frame system to others buildings that are just part of my language just crap <laughs> because they're old they haven't been maintained and the reuse potential is, is severe is severely limited so i think going forward it would be useful to somehow categorize buildings in terms of how much effort you would make in terms of the pre-demolition audit and then how much you know you would do in terms of extra circularity reuse options whereas i'd like to say that all you know you, you should be able to reuse a lot from all buildings i don't necessarily think that's the case for for all of them and some some will end up being you know crushed and um you know because just because of the quality and the value of materials in them they're just it, it's just not there it's feel, that, feel, that feels very similar to uh, challenges that we have across the circular economy in general and, and you know that's about the quality of the materials going into production in the first place and then the ability of those materials to be reused whether it's in the built environment whether it's in fashion um you know you could you could have that conversation for a lot of things um that you know the quality going in influences the quality coming out and i'm hoping that this is potentially a starting point of of designing in better quality because we then have the opportunity um or it becomes more commonplace 
um, to extract those materials and reuse them in future. So um, I hope that this is a, a starting point. Um, I think we need to move quite quickly because obviously, you know, we know about um, uh, the, the the kind of scale of the challenge that, that faces us. Um, but it's really exciting to hear from everyone today um, in terms of what, what is happening towards that. Um, so really, because we're, we're just coming up to time, um, I'd like to thank all of our panellists so um, Catherine from BRE, James from Erith, uh, Peter from Grimshaw um, and David from AECOM. Um, thanks also to ReLondon for organising this and um, for all of their efforts in Circular Economy Week in general. Um, do have a look at their website at all of the other um, events that they've going on that they've got going on this week. Um, there's some really interesting stuff to get involved in. So um, yeah, we'll leave, we'll leave it there and thank you, thank you for joining us.